So that whole process where data is um, analyzed to find out gap between what we're doing and what the organization expects at the highest level um, adds alignment, adds uh, effectiveness to the processes that we have. So technology should be for the organization or the organization for technology. Technology cannot come in until we actually have a process to have the right kind of data to impute into the technology. And then the aim of technology is to give us greater efficiency and improved effectiveness. So the facility management function uh, wants to use technology to address current FM problems, uh, wants to use technology for operational readiness planning, and also life cycle facility management using technology. So these are more like our high level goals. What problems and challenges are we having? How are we currently solving them? How can technology help? And then operational readiness planning. When we are trying to uh, pull together documentation for operational readiness, when we are trying to uh, create uh, automations in our maintenance program or operations program, how will technology help? And then when we are in the full cycle of operations and maintenance, how can we use technology to manage the life cycle of facility management? A lot of data needs to be tracked throughout the life cycle of every asset. And it's very important that we have technology to help us um, track these processes. A facility management is operated at three levels. We have the strategic uh, level where asset life cycle planning is done, capital replacement and improvements are, are executed or carried out. And then emergency preparedness and business continuity planning, they take place at the strategic level. And then you have the tactical level, you do space planning, operations and maintenance uh, plans, uh, budgets, uh, uh, projects, right? And then the operational level, you do the routine operations, inspections, uh, O&M execution activities. But city managers, uh, no matter what the level you're operating in at any particular time, you need to have a proper mindset, uh, a framework for deploying uh, technology. Uh, like I said at the onset, start with the FM deliverables. What do we want to achieve, right? If you don't focus on what you want to achieve, you see yourself drifting along the path of those IT people that build the software. IT should listen to us and code in response to what we need, not us bend in response to what IT can code, right? Uh, handover of the river documentation must be in standard data formats for some applications. Uh, we're talking about Kobe, uh, especially when we're looking at BIM as a technology for uh, taking on new projects. Uh, we'll talk about BIM in a bit. FM data implementation should commence concurrently uh, throughout the building uh, construction. So data is always supposed to be gathered for decision making and for technology adoption and then ensure that, uh, you know, uh, incrementally ensuring quality delivery. Uh, you can't wait to the end of a large project to do a large data dump. You keep improving the processes of gathering data so that intelligent decisions and intelligent analysis can be done. I'm going to look at technology from the built environment. What kind of uh, technologies can we expect to see in the buildings that we manage. Uh, tagging, for example, uh, everything from 1D barcodes, uh, one-dimensional barcodes, which are just straight lines that can be used to codify information that can give you access to a database um, that stores all the information about a particular asset. If you're writing so much stories about the asset and the body of the asset, you just use a little bit of a sticker, right? And then you have the 2D um, uh, uh, barcodes, which we call the QR or quick reference uh, codes that also give you the same access, store a lot more information. And then you go from there to the RFID, the radio frequency identification tags. These are all sophistication levels in being able to tag your assets. And when you tag manually, what you're basically trying to do is you have a list of assets and you create a, a manual tag um, to put on, on any of those uh, assets. And you say, oh, well, these assets are being tracked because I have a spreadsheet in front of me that I look at regularly to see the status 
of each of the assets. Now, but if I want to move that database to be integrated with my uh, 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 workplace booking, uh, my maintenance programs, uh, you know, my, my space allocations and so on and so forth, my cost and budget management, I need to have that data in a software, right? So whether I access it through a 1D barcode, a 2D a QR code, or a, a three, four dimensional RFID, the whole asset, the whole idea is to gain access for the right persons into the database of that asset. So that's a huge technology that can save us time and effort. Imagine having your maintenance crew just go around and uh, using their phone to scan um, devices as part of um, inspections, just to check when was the last um, time this equipment was serviced, uh, check what material was placed at the last time, how long it took to service, how much cost went into it um, for the last time and also for a certain period. You can do all of that analysis by just scanning the device and the device portal opens to see everything about that particular device. And when you want to replace a, a, an item or equipment, you can get all the information, the entire life cycle analysis of that uh, uh, equipment or asset is in your face. You can tell this is, you know, I want to replace it because of this reason. When somebody asks you, why do you say it's too expensive to maintain? Why do you say it's breaking down so often? You have the data to back such uh, conclusions. Technology for leak detection and speed repairs based on data analysis from sensors. Sensors can actually pick out uh, moisture uh, uh, levels within uh, ducted spaces or within uh, uh, chambers. Uh, uh, pressure changes uh, at various points in a piping network can also help to detect leakage and detect the exact uh, zones where the leakage is happening. So sensors will do a lot of wonders in our facility. And then intelligent waste collection powered by sensors in waste receptacles. Imagine managing a mall and having 20, 30 cleaners go around every room, every space, checking how much uh, uh, depth you have in every uh, waste bin, right? What if you have a sensor that, you know, actually senses how much waste you have in each of those uh, bins? You can actually have less than 10% of the staff uh, strength required to change out uh, bin liners and take out trash because now you just have on your phone where the trash that is being filled are. Your level of service will bump up and your cost will at the same time uh, drop. So having so many people hanging around and doing uh, the same on data as going to a room and checking that the bin is still empty. There's no need for that. You just know exactly where it is. And then adjustment to energy demand by household appliances to reaction to dynamic energy pricing. So we talked about uh, energy and sustainability the, uh, uh, the last class. Uh, so if you need to do demand management, demand management is where you uh, program certain things to happen, uh, certain loads to be off, uh, to make take advantage of certain uh, uh, beneficial uh, tariff. You put up systems, you put up technology, uh, sensors that takes control of those control systems so that they don't come on at the time you don't want them to come on. And then think about the circuit level energy uh, uh, savings through real-time insights in energy usage per load point. This is the energy uh, management system I was introducing to you guys uh, in the last class. You can know exactly what's happening at every circuit level, right? Every equipment. Uh, that's, that's a huge uh, data set to deal with because what that does for you is it gives you intelligence as to equipment uh, uh, failure, uh, uh, modes and, and patterns, you get a sense of an equipment that is going to go out of service or go uh, uh, broken in a while because you are actually seeing the energy use pattern. It is drawing more than it's rated energy. It is trying to use it for, for, some, for some anomaly or some failure in the system. So you get that sense. You're able to distribute bills more equitably because you have smart metering in place. Reduce congestion in the use of transportation infrastructure, such as roads and parking spaces. You know, sometimes uh, you just undermine that, uh, you know, you don't take it seriously. That technology that gives you visibility into where there are crowds, where there are holdups, you know, and so on and so forth. We can use this same uh, type of technology to manage parking lots in a very busy uh, mall or busy uh, uh, urban center. Nobody needs to drive around all the parking lots to know where there's a vacant a lot to park. That's a waste of fuel, a waste of time, right? And also make your parking lot inefficient. If you have a sensor on every car park uh, space, somebody who's coming in 
immediately sees all the car parts in the board and knows exactly where you have um, a specific drag straight there and go and park, and then that goes off as max as of five. You have real time access to sensors as well as video data for proactive occupant safety um, efforts. Data driven decision making at all levels of management results in effective solutions to problems. More of the FM uh, technologies still on the buildings. You have the mobile electronic devices such as smartphones, tablets, and laptops for controlling lights, cooling, and everyday appliances. Right. So having those cool apps in your devices that helps you to control uh, your building uh, is it's, it's both efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency in the sense that you save a lot, you save on energy a lot, you save on uh, cost of running your facility. You don't have to have standby people uh, waiting to operate things because you can actually do those operations um, with your phones, right? So uh, think about it. I don't have somebody. I don't need somebody who's going to change uh, uh, over for the generator. I don't need somebody who's going to, uh, uh, you know, do any kind of adjustment for me. Everything is done automatically because I have uh, sensors and apps in my phones and tablets that I can use to uh, send signals to those sensors and make them to. Uh, do some control. At last, I keep sensors to monitor the condition of their plants for predictive maintenance, right? Um, so, 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 if you have a likelihood of failing, um, you may not necessarily install uh, or deploy a preventive maintenance strategy because of its cost. You may want to optimize your maintenance budget by using a predictive maintenance uh, strategy. But the thing about predictive maintenance strategy is that there must be a constant data stream that gives us indication of the condition of the asset. It is based on the condition that we decide to act or not to act uh, with regards to that uh, with, with regards to that asset. And you have the remote uh, building monitoring and control uh, combined with occupants recognition system for seamless uh, effective security. You, you, you just uh, have this peace of mind that you're not going to have uh, uh, something onto what happening in your estate or facility because you have a technology for uh, recognizing each people, each person that comes into the uh, facility, uh, making sure that they have the proper credentials and clearance, not only for the uh, building uh, ingress on its own, but also for every level of every space uh, within the building. And this is not also expensive anymore. You can actually uh, uh, turn on um, a, a building uh, a monitoring technology, a system that helps you do most of all the things you're the security guards, the cleaners, your, your staff on ground, we have to do manually. And then there's a huge world of uh, uh, IT now called Internet of Things, the IoT. The networks are intelligent. Uh, uh, they give feedback on virtually everything, everything. The light is talking to the AC about occupancy. Uh, the AC is talking about talking to uh, you know, the light is talking to the outside uh, uh, brightness uh, about uh, harvesting daylight and, and ambient lighting in the space. Uh, you, are, you are looking at uh, uh, IoT devices that can be in stores that can tell you when certain items you have in your store are being depleted so that your, your other levels can be, can be automated. You can have all kinds of things set up uh, using IoT. And now we have uh, data we acquire from uh, energy consumption energy use and data we acquire from uh, uh, water and other metering that can be that can be monitored remotely uh, using the internet because we now have access to the IP. Virtually, virtually every data point now having an IP of its own means that they can represent themselves online. How can, we, can, we can log in with the right credentials and gain access to such uh, data. Even landscapes have their own technology, right? Imagine if a plant in your garden does not need as much water as the next plant, you know, uh, across the garden, right? But what happens right now is that we water everything, everything the same anyway, right? Uh, but if you program uh, a system that controls the irrigation uh, network in your facility, you can actually provide just enough water for this plant and just enough water for the next plant. And you see how your, um, uh, your, your green areas or whatever uh, garden system you have in place will uh, uh, turn lush and green without having any downside or droughts. Think about street lighting. Uh, street lights are always put on. They just put them on and they run all night, right? Uh, 
I think about how many millions of street lights are just there, uh, lighting when nobody's using the lights, and uh, you, you can you can have best to save that energy, right? Uh, think about a system where you have uh, you know uh, uh, trackers, you know, on the roadside, maybe on the curbs that tracks, you know, dogs, cats, human beings coming through, uh, vehicles driving. Uh, senses their speed, provides enough light to give them visibility for, for, for the movements they are, they are moving at night, uh, you know, and just create the ambience that you want to have, but at least be, be there to have the ambience. And then you save all that power that is used to power uh, streetlights endlessly, right? It, the consumption reduction will be, uh, will be massive. And then for your inspections, there are so many things you cannot physically go to see, right? Um, you've got to report that uh, you look through some one of your one or two of your windows at, at the 11th and 15th floors, and you have seen that uh, some of those uh, metal uh, clips that are holding on to the glass uh, uh, facade or curtain wall, they are becoming rusted, and an accident is imminent because they can all collapse at a certain point. But not all of them have the defect, and you want to do that inspection. How will you go set up a scaffolding system? Uh, you know. Uh, to go around uh, all of these, uh, uh, even if you have, even if you have a, a cradle that will bring you down, and you have to do that one by one, uh, panel by panel, uh, you still have uh, cost to build. But if you have a drone today for that inspection, the drone can go panel by panel, observing, taking pictures, you know, taking videos, and you are seeing it live real time. You know, and these drones are so cheap these days. You can get some drones for for for, for less than two hundred dollars, uh, and it comes with a camera built in. You know, uh, and you recharge it. You know, so there's really there's really um, not much uh, you 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 require to get you know technology uh, of this nature in your facility. Provided you're not flying it over other people's uh, uh, property, you probably don't even need a license to use a drone in your own. Um, in your own uh, facility. And then robots, there are robots that can do uh, uh, pool cleaning, robots that can go into docks and clean up the entire suit in your docks, robots that can go into uh, uh, trenches to identify where you have blockages and what kind of blockages you have in there, you know, uh, you know, snake robots and all kinds of robots that can go in and move in uh, with a camera and give you visibility uh, to things uh, uh, that you're probably struggling with. Uh, there are so many facilities that are being broken apart today just to get through uh, to some foundation uh, element or to some buried item in some in some piping whereas you can use the technology to take care of that all right uh, and so uh, uh, and, and everything about technology these days is about data everything we are, we are trying to do has to do with data analysis big data uh, being able to get a lot of information from all our activities from all the users of our facilities from all the experiences we have, from all the uh, feedback we're getting on a regular basis, and make certain inferences, uh, make certain deductions, uh, is also technology to, to analyze, to, to acquire those data, to, make, to analyze it and give you some kind of uh, uh, conclusion that you can, um, you can, you can use um, in, your, in your service as a facility manager. There's so much more. Uh, you have smart energy uh, that uh, looks at uh, energy duration, lowering the uh, cost of Energy, energy generation and helping you to uh, reduce your load. So what we talked about uh, in our energy class, where we talked about you doing load shifting and load shedding, there are certain systems you can have in place that can automate that demand management, right? Uh, uh, it, it senses when you are reaching your peak load and takes out low priority um, uh, uh, load requirements and moves them to other time. So instead of having a manual process, for uh, let's say I just change my flow switch to uh, a timer switch to move it from morning to evening and evening to morning. I still have to have a uh, 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 something that uh, help me to send information back from the tank or from whatever I'm uh, maybe I'm doing a pumping uh, back to the motor to say I'm full, right? Um, so there's a combination of technology that can all come into one uh, system, one IoT system where sensors are integrated with controllers. To handle switches and valves, and you can get a lot uh, uh, done um, inside that uh, uh, deployment. Uh, think about your energy generation. We don't have that level of technology yet, but meters can actually be bi-directional, which means that you can have solar, so many panels that you're generating more electricity that you can use, and the meter will be 
reversing that that uh, kind of running that excess um, uh, current you're you are generating into the grid so that others can can use it and then uh, later when you need it at night and your panels are, are not having sun sunlight uh, your your current is is taken from the grid and you can have um, uh, you can have uh, your, your your energy back you just have that reconciliation process that takes place because of smart grids uh, in nowadays we, we now have uh, a renewable systems embedded with uh, your your fossil uh, fuel system. You can have your solar panels installed, and they are synchronized with your generators uh, in, in 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 the same uh, array, such that the generators don't kick in until the solar panels during the day have satisfied their load consumption. What what they, everybody cannot take that the generators will take right, and once they are taking it as the load is increasing, the generators can be coming on one by one. And then you don't even have to have batteries because of this technology. You know, batteries and the storage that go with uh, renewable energy is one of the biggest uh, challenge today with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know, renewable uh, deployment. Because if I'm going to deploy a 20 kilowatt um, uh, 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 solar uh, system today, I'm going to be uh, talking about 70% uh, 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 storage and 70% cost for storage and batteries, right? Just imagine just having that off because I have a synchronizing panel that synchronizes it with my other energy sources. What that does for me is that I don't even have to invest in the storage. It just, it just runs the power for daytime and then uh, uh, transfers the excess load um, in the synchronizing panel. And so instead of getting a, a 250 kVA generator, for example, I can use a series of 2020 kVAs, like five uh, uh, 20 kVAs and solar panels that can pull in um, uh, you know, uh, about 300 kilowatts or 200 kilowatts of, 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 of energy from sunlight on a very bright day, right? So what that means is I'm actually providing capacity for my off-peak loads um, using the generators. And they don't even have to all kick in at the same time, right? With the synchronizing panel, they can kick in one by one by one, and my energy consumption will automatically be squeezed to the barest minimum, right? So technology has... Uh, uh, a lot of advantages, you know, we have uh, appliances that uh, temporarily stops consuming energy when the, the demand or the peak is being a, a, a rich. If you're, if you're a non-priority equipment, you're programmed uh, to just shut down and allow the peak not to be exceeded. Uh, water solutions, minimizing waste and, and the quality of, of, of water in our facilities. There are systems for monitoring waste, uh, water leakage in our facilities. Uh, there are systems So that we don't treat water that we uh, want to use for uh, uh, watering the grass, for example. Uh, we treat uh, water that is going to be portable, that we want to use as uh, portable water, and run them through different channels so that we're not wasting resources. Um, and then we can segregate and separate how these lines run. And then, of course, uh, uh, there are other predictive tools that can help you predict uh, 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 flood uh, flood and, and uh, uh, storm, uh, other impacts of weather and, and climate on our environment, um, on our own buildings. So many of us must have been part of some IT process where we've deployed technology in the past. Uh, we would not always have success with all um, uh, technology uh, deployments. Uh, we have experience with one form of failure or the other. But if you don't take your time to plan, especially looking from the standpoint of what you as an organization will benefit from that technology, there's a high likelihood that it's going to fail. So, uh, and the people who are supposed to work in technology deployment, it's not just the FN, it's not just the FN that should decide uh, uh, what we need to use technology for and how to go about technology deployment. We need the IT team, we need some, somebody from the HR, we need somebody from finance and accounts, uh, 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 you know, all of, on board so that the reviews can be as broad based as, plus, as possible. Because sometimes if you're coming up with, a, with an idea or a technology you want to deploy, you, you, you try to put the business case together and you find out that the IT guys cannot support it because they're not integrated with the server type, they're not integrated with other frameworks we have in the organization. Uh, sometimes you've gone so far talking to vendors only to find out that uh, there's a policy against uh, uh, divulging certain information, information privacy, uh, information uh, data asset management strategies or policies in the organization that that software deployment will, 
will fail. So bringing people from you know, these uh, uh, subgroups will help to uh, reduce the uh, uh, kind of mistakes that we can, we can make. As soon as you understand your business, you understand what you want from technology, in going out to look for technology, you now have a template or a checklist that you can now say, I'm looking for technology that can do A, B, C, D. So that if that technology is not exactly what you are finding among the options you, you see in the market, then you cannot find those that can uh, uh, modify uh, without uh, charging you an arm and, 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 and a leg um, to fit your requirements. And when purchasing technology, don't buy technology for just today. We want to solve today's problem. Think about tomorrow's problem. Think about the kind of changes, the kind of growth we are going to experience and how this technology will support that process. Ask questions like who will own the data, the IP or patent or copyright of, of data that goes into technology is, is supposed to be owned um, uh, in the system. If you don't ask those questions and you sign up for technology deal today, you might end up uh, shortchanging yourself by moving all the data that you have into a platform and the day you don't pay for this platform, they shut you out and you don't have access to it. Many people, many people come uh, 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 enter such situations and they don't even know what to do, right? The data that you put into any platform is supposed to be yours, okay? And then think about all the other costs that go with it. There was a, there was a client that deployed a particular FM software and they had a struggle trying to uh, get it to work. They were able to update their asset register, but when they were trying to deploy their processes, they were finding some restrictions. For example, certain addresses were not being accepted because the system was wired to a certain uh, formatting uh, type that requires the postcode and things like that. And so they wanted to get support from the uh, uh, developers and suppliers of the software. And they were being told that uh, every hour of support uh, is $1,000. Uh, and then they added two and two together and they just called it, called it off, right? So how, why would you want me to be paying $1,000 for every time I get uh, support for, from you uh, uh, per hour? Uh, whereas I bought an, a, a, soft, a software that's probably less than six to seven thousand dollars, and we are charging me so much for support. So those things should be known in advance, so you don't get into a trap when deploying uh, technology, right? Uh, as for the uh, implementation process, work backwards from go live date, which means you need to know uh, as at what time you will need this technology uh, fully running in your facility. Uh, you need to know. Uh, what milestones you can put in place. You know, when you get to a certain point, you know that we have achieved this milestone and so on and so forth. So you can uh, create a, a, a story around how the implementation went. You can have lessons learned to celebrate victories or small wins along the way. Uh, whenever there are issues, know how to escalate them uh, as well. Once you've implemented a software in your facility, there's usually that uh, uh, sustainability issue. It is there. Some people don't know how to use it. Some know how to use it. Some are struggling to do certain things with it. Initially, to look at if it is slowing down your processes. And if you don't have a check-in with users regularly, they start abandoning it little by little. So the excitement of having the technology in should not be allowed to wait. You have to keep that momentum up by continually training, and engaging with people, and ensuring that they can continue to use the technology and produce a result. Because if they are not seeing the result, and forget, they will not be interested at all, all right? So, 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 so bringing all this back to facility management and asking ourselves, you know, why? If I ask you today why you want technology, you probably be talking about the technology itself. But you should be talking about yourself, you're talking about your, your, your objectives. Those are the real reasons why you are, you are in business, right? Um, and so I'm thinking about what I'm going to do for my organization, asset value, right? Returns on investment. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do for the people, uh, productivity of the uh, workplace and the well-being of the users. How does technology fit into this? How do I use technology to, to provide this? Um, that's what all technology uh, considerations uh, are about, all right? So we talked about data. If you answer the questions about what you want to do as an organization, before you start thinking about what technology you want to use, you start putting together the right kind of data. Do you have drawings, for example, right? Do you have uh, uh, operations processes? Do you have uh, uh, budgets? Do you have, uh, you know, what exactly um, uh, are you having in place as data or processes you can use to manage your, your technology deployment? Those are what we're talking about. You cannot 
move into technology when the basic information you need to manage facilities you don't already have. All right. So you're going to come across this kind of list again and again uh, across this program. The things that you should have in place with you as a facility manager when managing facilities. Talk about as build drawings. How can you scope work without having as build drawings? How can you uh, 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 even uh, identify or pinpoint all the assets in your facility? I know people that create facility assets register and uh, there's a director there, there are ACs there. You, and you're not looking at your space hierarchy. You're not looking at your, uh, you know, what is in every space. You, you try, you can dimension them in your asset register. So in your view drawings, you can actually come up with that uh, details that go into your asset register. Uh, so that's comprehensive asset register. There has been bits of quantity. Construction snags and defects uh, that can help you with uh, uh, all the other repairs that you'll be doing in the future. So you know where those repairs need to start from during construction. Uh, uh, the details of those who were part of the uh, construction, who supplied uh, various things uh, uh, in the past, because you will need them. You have certain specifications that you have certain suppliers for. If you have that relationship on going, it may be cheaper uh, to maintain. Uh, it's also easier for you to source uh, the right things instead of going for alternative when you don't know whether the, the items you're originally installed can still be sourced uh, from the original vendors that supply them. Guarantees and, and, and warranties. Uh, you go into uh, managing a facility and certain actions you take, avoiding the warranties that you have. You have. Uh, there are certain conditions of your warranties that you don't even understand that you should know um, as you go in. Uh, the operations and maintenance manual. Uh, these are manual developed by the developers, the contractors, the uh, equipment manufacturers, and the OEM reps that you are, that are supplying the components and equipment in your facilities, right? Uh, what are the things that have been built in, uh, the drawings, the specification, uh, the operational processes, the maintenance processes, the spare parts, and all of those things, they form part of that o and uh, manual. So you don't go ahead, you don't make the mistake of using the wrong chemical to do the, uh, the wrong work or getting um, uh, uh, the wrong parts into um, a certain equipment that will uh, lead to a failure eventually. On and on and on is this list of things you must have in place. This is baseline. This is FM 101, right? So you now say, I have my FM information management system in place. I have the data I need to manage my facility. It is from here. I now say, I'm going to deploy technology to get it done faster and do things uh, better. So this is where we have our biggest issue. It's not really about the technology because there are so many developers there that can actually uh, develop whatever you want specifically. And then there are thousands of softwares already developed that are languishing the internet that nobody is buying, right? So that can be very good for the kind of uh, solution you are, you, are, you are seeking, right? But then you must deal with the data issue. So if you are in a position to be part of a project um, that is going to deliver a property to you to manage, uh, start immediately to work on that integration. That's how to work with the various architecture, engineering, and construction professionals to ensure that the, the, the data that is being generated from the work, starting from the planning to the execution, are coordinated in such a way that it's in a format that you as an FM can use, okay? So let's look at a few of those systems I talked about uh, before. Uh, you can write the maintenance management system, uh, have maintenance things to record, keep record of assets, schedule and track maintenance uh, tasks, keep a historical record of work as they are performed, and maintain a computer database of all the information on maintenance. If I want to know, uh, particular assets, how many times have been maintained in the last 10 years, how many components have been replaced, uh, how many hours have gone into it, and so on and so forth. I can easily get those data from inside a, a seminar because that's where I, I, I did the work. So I, I will talk about work order, for example, when I was doing a, a maintenance planning, right? If you are using a seminar system, that work order is a tool for uh, tracking and adding uh, more information on a regular basis. So that information becomes the database for that uh, uh, management, that, day, that particular asset. Uh, because CMMS is very basic, um, before you start thinking of a caffeine system, uh, before you start thinking of a uh, IWMS system, or even deploying for your new project, 
uh, a safe mess would be a starting point, would be a starting point for facility managers, you know, uh, uh, just to just to automate that process, just to become more proactive in managing your your facility. But then you already need to have uh, 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 your, your your maintenance plan in place, a spreadsheet that can be imported, for example. You have your asset register that can be imported, you know, uh, and then uh, you have the various user groups, the maintenance team, the building users, and so on that can be imported. Um, we talked about the CAFM system, the computer aided facility management, as a system that supports uh, the facility manager's entire uh, uh, work processes. So space is managed, moves and locations, um, preventing maintenance like we saw in uh, CMMS. So in essence, the CAFM system also has a CMMS in, in, incorporated or, or part of it, right? Uh, reactive repairs, uh, how to track reports, uh, all facility operations are done inside a CAFM system. So just to, uh, if, you, if, you, if you are able to uh, move straight to a CAFM system, uh, that can manage all your uh, uh, operations and maintenance. It's fantastic uh, because it has more strategic uh, uh, features or, or, or you know or benefits that you can sell to senior management. For example, you could have a big issue with security, and just because you want to manage access control, go for a CAFM system that can give you all the other benefits, including uh, maintenance. So effective strategic planning, space inventory and management, space forecasting. Uh, moving and relocation activities, costs and, and, and processes, continuous improvement because you're able to generate reports on a broad range of activities uh, that you perform as a facility manager. Uh, improved project planning, fast and accurate reporting on critical facilities information. Existing processes will become more efficient and streamlined. Uh, improved safety and environmental planning capabilities. Significant improvements in disaster planning capabilities, data standardization across uh, an organization. Uh, some of the benefits you can get from deploying a, a CAFM system. All of the issues for consideration uh, uh, in deploying, whether it's a CMMS, a CAFM or an IWMS uh, system, are basically the same thing. Uh, you must have a rock solid business case because management doesn't want to see uh, your proposals as something that makes them to just throw money around, okay? Um, so just throw money around. Uh, you need to have you need to have uh, 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 a focus. You must have efficiency solutions that that uh, computer system is going to bring, as well as effectiveness. And effectiveness are very powerful because they tie up to strategy um, in your in your putting together your analysis, right? And then you can easily get approval. But once you get cinema admit approval uh, when deploying the CAFM system, you have uh, almost fifty percent of your work done because from then on. It now has to be you managing the project deployment process, answering all the questions, scoping properly, ensuring that people understand they're properly trained, and ensuring that there is a follow up process, a mechanism for chain management that uh, runs without deployment so that nothing uh, is left uh, uh, unknown or unchecked uh, through that deployment process. But technology itself, whether it's CAFM, of VMS, or CMMS, um, usually suffers from certain uh, challenges. Uh, your work as a facility manager is often seen as a maintenance job, right? And when you're trying to optimize it, it's almost looking as if you're trying to ask them to spend more money on making your life easier, right? <laughs> so, 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 so how do you justify that? Uh, you want to do more, that's efficiency. That's something you want to use. Find numbers, find objective means of, of showing that you can do more. Uh, you want to use less, less labor, less cost, right? Uh, those are efficiency measures. Find measures, find numbers that you can throw in as performance measures to show management that if this deployment goes on, this is what we are going to uh, be able to uh, achieve, right? And then you want to have uh, uh, strategic alignment, effectiveness measures. Oh, we want part of our additional goal is to improve our sustainability metrics. With this technology, we can track our carbon footprint, for example. That's a, an effectiveness measure. We want to improve uh, occupant well-being. With this technology, we can have um, a, a tracking mechanism that will ensure that we know uh, 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 when people have complaints or when there are issues first before they even uh, uh, bring it up to our, to our knowledge. So a lot of things will happen through that process of using effectiveness and efficiency to analyze the benefits so that we can overcome most of the hurdles or challenges that, uh, that, that we will face. 
some of these challenges include political priorities, for example. Management or somebody in, in, in the executive management does not uh, like uh, your face and as fact that no one to buy into technology uh, that you are bringing uh, up. Uh, somebody's, you know, uh, uh, put together a, a strategy, strategy and some uh, mandates for you to implement and you don't have funding. Uh, maybe you didn't come up with a budget on time and it wasn't captured. Uh, and then the bigger issues of data, uh, data disparities, data uh, quality, as well as additional stovepipes, where you have departments working and keeping their data separately. Uh, they are not integration, they're not talking to each other. The challenge for facility managers is to overcome this obstacle by utilizing the resources available and convincing leadership that efficiencies and cost saving can be achieved with investments in technology, such as a well planned captain system or any other system that you feel is appropriate for your uh, organization. Uh, one very advanced technology that is uh, taking over the uh, built environment now, uh, it's a new trend, is called video information modeling. Intelligent 3D model based process that equips building professionals with insights and tools to efficiently plan, design, construct, and manage buildings and infrastructure. So, the entire data that is generated from planning to design to the construction is digitally presented, and all documentations are embedded on that digital twin that is produced from that uh, 3D model. All designers are uh, putting together the interpretation of the brief to create a design. They work in a common data environment. They work in one interface, right? So if somebody uh, uh, needs to run electric uh, cables through um, uh, a wall, for example, um, somebody putting the wall there uh, is working in that same space where the guy who's going to put electric cables inside that wall uh, is working. So in essence, we all are putting information and the specifications from every item in the bill of quantities are also put into the uh, project. The quantities are measured and, 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 and made more accurate. And then as facility managers, when that building development process reaches to us, we don't have to ask too many questions because all the data, all the data chronologically uh, 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 logged into every of those uh, uh, asset components becomes available to us, right? So we don't have to start looking for files and, and paper to refer to uh, documents to refer to because all of those documentation are built into the uh, model, depending on the level of the dimension or the level of detail that we uh, 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 go for in that facility. So all the information we need are, are brought together. Uh, we, can, we can manage the building for its entire life cycle. Uh, there's a lot of cost saving in the construction process. There's a lot of cost saving in the operational man management, uh, maintenance of the facility, because we have information right at our fingertips, right? Uh, we don't have to waste time uh, finding out issues and solving them. And updating the information back into the model makes it a standard tool for managing from end uh, to end. And then on the uh, building itself, you know, we talked about two sides to the uh, uh, building management technology. The technology for managing the building and technology that built into the building itself. Uh, one of such technology that is very advanced uh, uh, in terms of uh, how we uh, gather data about the assets we manage and how we control the assets by the building management system, the BMS. It's a control system that can be used to monitor and manage the mechanical, electrical, electromechanical services in the facility. It's installed as a standalone application or can be integrated with other monitoring systems. So it monitors. How does it monitor? You have wired sensors across uh, various aspects of the building. Every window, every air conditioner, every light. Uh, you have uh, uh, sensors for uh, light intensity. You have sensors for ambient temperature. You have sensors for humidity. You have sensors for occupancy. You have sensors for uh, temperature uh, uh, across all uh, uh, systems. You have sensors for electricity presence and flow rate, water flow rate. All of these sensors are wired into a central machine. That machine is also wired back into the controllers for all of those building components. So I can, I can, I can, I can get a sensor telling me in that machine that there's nobody in the conference room on the fifth floor. With that information, I send a signal to the controller of the air conditioners in the fifth floor. They switch off those uh, air conditioners because there's nobody in the fifth floor. Uh, conference room, and then they switch off uh, a sensor, uh, from, uh, signals to the uh, controllers of the uh, uh, lighting system in the fifth, fifth floor conference room to switch off all of those uh, lighting systems, right? So that's what the BMS, the big management system does. 
if there's a crowd in one part of the building and the oxygen level is depleting, a CO2 sensor can tell me that the oxygen level is depleting because CO2 level is getting too high for that space. And people can start painting in that space, right? So what do I do? There are certain dampers that will open, uh, or valves that will open and bring in fresh air from the outside my uh, 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 chiller system or my central air conditioning system. Or if I don't have an air conditioning system, I probably have windows that can be controlled. I have some motor controllers. I can open certain windows and bring in fresh air from outside. Once they reach, the LCD is enriched within the space, I can see it because there's a sensor on the motor to tell me the speed of the motor. There's a sensor on the motor to tell me how hot the motor is going, right? And also telling me this, the, the flow rate of the uh, fluid that is running through that uh, pumping mechanism. So if the, if the flow rate is, if the signal coming from the flow rate is telling me that the flow rate is very low and the machine is working very hard, the temperature is also going up, there's a sign of a problem. In fact, those three signals will already trigger um, um, an indication of an error or a problem that I need to quickly attend to, right? So this is all about sensing and controlling, but there's the usual uh, human uh, uh, interface involved. It, it's, it's good for controlling internal comfort uh, controls, uh, room control, staff relatives can be maintained. They have a standard for how cold the space should be. So you're always checking to be sure that it is always, you know, to that temperature. Uh, you're monitoring energy consumption and, and doing management, uh, uh, demand management to move and running the facility with a, a master stroke, like a controller uh, at the central point uh, because of the data you are getting from all of those, right? Or your, your installation data, your commissioning data, all of this are managed from, from that point. And then it also stores uh, historical data on how the assets are running and how they are being maintained uh, in the system you know, for future reference. Now, but the beauty management system requires you to uh, read the sensing and you know, send signals for the controls. Uh, that's logic. That's reasoning that you have to bring in, uh, uh, can be removed when we move into a building automation system. A building automation system has sensors, has controllers, and center pro central processor that, is, that will normally look at the ambient temperature in a certain space. Um, and then look at how much sunlight I have outside because I'm getting those two signals in my in my in my in my BMS uh, uh, screen. I can decide to dim or shut down the artificial light so that the outside light can be invested into that space, and I will get as much uh, 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 luminous intensity I need for that ambient. Right. So so I'll be doing that. But in a building automation system, the system takes care of that. That's what we call buildings that have the BAS installed, intelligent or smart buildings. Now they call them to they have to reduce impacts at that point where we have sensors, we have controllers, not only talking to us, but talking to each other, right? And if a BAS system can be uh, uh, used, it can be uh, thrown into the internet through a gateway, which means I can now remotely monitor, see how things are happening in my facility. Even though the facility is now pretty much taken off itself, then that is deployment of internet of things. Uh, internet of things is that point where we get to where Every controller, every sensor on its own is an IP, right? Each of them can send signals into the cloud and we can harness them in a software that we have uh, somewhere and then we can have access to data and analytics and action can be taking place within the facility and the asset controlling themselves without us even doing anything. Energy can be saved up to 30%. Environmental impact is significant. Security is you know, ramped up. Uh, uh, building maintenance is, uh, is optimized. Uh, it's got very high level predictive maintenance, a uh, of convenience, return status update, constant access, uh, and then time savings. So all the things that a BMS can do, a BS can do it for the additional automation, which means it can do it on its own without you even uh, uh, getting involved. So HVAC, lighting, uh, issues with, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, fiscal uh, uh, structures and uh, components in the building like windows and doors, uh, your CCTVs and ultra low voltage, 
access control and security and, and like fire alarms and the rest can all be automated using a BAS system. What are some things to look out for uh, when uh, delving into technology deployment? Uh, let's especially set right, not to be over ambitious, make over promises that technology cannot uh, deliver. Set certain targets for specific outcomes and let there be commitments. Let there be adequate planning. Don't jump, don't rush. Uh, let the choice and the options you, you go for be of high quality, right? It's better to uh, take a small section and test it out with the technology than to roll out across the organization in one big scoop and then uh, fall flat on your face. Lack of communication and lack of authority, especially from the uh, FM, being able to handle chain management within the organization. Because if you are not high enough in the organization, you may not be able to force people to adopt what you are trying to bring into the organization. All right, so that's our lesson. Uh, let me hear your, your comments. Uh, now, this particular lesson doesn't have an assessment. We're lucky. <laughs> okay, so let me hear your comments uh, about technology and um, let's have that discussion. If you have a question or comment, please raise your hand. Uh, I'll give a five minutes break and we'll have the discussion in just a bit. So I'll be, be the first to speak now. Okay, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Thank everyone. you for the lecture. Oh, about what you what we discussed today, what you explained, what was the cost implication of those software? Um the cost implication, you know, we are in Nigeria. <laughs> so I don't know how it will actually work. I think some people are using it, but not it's very few and it's very rare. Yes. To see those I agree. working right in Nigeria. I agree, but the truth yes. is, the truth is cost is not the biggest factor why we are not using it. So what's the we, biggest? We need to develop a need for it. For example, for example, um, if you are working in a community where people are jobless and you want to start using robots to cut grass, do you have a need for it? You know what I'm saying? If you are if you are managing a facility and your total energy bill in a month is less than one million, and you now want to go and deploy an energy management system to create smart demand management and all that, that probably will cost you three to five million in deployment. Do you have a need for that? There's a justification for that, right? The moment a problem is big enough to require technology. You will be you will you first of all do an analysis of the problem before you start looking for the right technology to support the, the change that you are looking for, right? So uh, we have not most of us are operating in facilities that are not at that scale where technology needs to be deployed. Some of us are because if you are uh, managing a a, a a large multi-tenanted high rise or a mall, for example, or a hotel, even as a single uh, client use facility. Uh, you cannot ignore energy because some some month bills will be getting to 40 50 million for one month bill uh, mm. so you're you're you asking you're racking your brain around how can i save 10 percent of that can i save 20 percent of that and you know what that means in naira and cover so that is what drives the, the technology adoption if i deploy this i'm going to save this i'm going to make this that becomes something that is easy to sell i'm going to so that's why i talked about efficiency benef uh, benefits and effectiveness benefits so that we can align them and lay them out as the reason why we want to. So once you have a need for it, you now ask, you know, but that need must be established first. That's the point. Oh. All right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Kazim. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir. I have an experience, uh, like a uh, stroke uh, question. One is I once manage a property without issue with the, with the plumbing system. So the owner of the property now asked me to get in touch with the architect that designed the place. Mm -hmm. So to give me the drawing. Mm -hmm. But I think they yeah, are like, yeah, trying to dodge that aspect. But luckily for me, one of the guy, one of the plumbing guys that did the installation mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. the landlord has his number. Mm -hmm. so because we're going back and forth. The, yeah. the owner of that property now sent the number to me. So when I called the guy, 
it was that plumber that now told me that this is the uh, the way they run, uh, run the piping of this. But the architect, architect initially was denying it. So until we now have to break that place, even even before we broke uh, broke the the place, the owner of the property was like, Kazim, this thing cannot work. My architect has told me this. This I said that I said, sir, I'm not disputing what they are saying, but the guy, this is what the guy is saying. Let's do it first. Then if this thing did not work, then we know. They, that they, we know what we know the next thing to do. Yeah. For, fortunately for us, after we build that place, there. we find the problem there. <laughs> yeah, another place, the same property, the same thing occur. So this this second time, the, the owner did not even say, uh, you don't, okay, just go ahead because we, <laughs> uh, <laughs> initially. Yeah. So what I just discovered now is it's like those guys they used to dodge when you ask for the document. They are trying to dodge that aspect. They don't want to give it to us. It was later I even discovered that the architect also has a facility management company. Maybe it was like after the completion of this, maybe it might be the one that will take over the management of the property. I'm not sure, but I'm just saying that. The truth is that 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 they are are always handicapped. They are always handicapped because they don't have operational readiness mindset. They have okay. design drawings. They make changes during construction. They don't redo as good drawings. So they don't really have as good drawings. So that's the truth. Okay. So you have to now do your own as good drawings. Mm-hmm. By sitting down with that plumber to do sketches, you can do freehand sketches. You get the draftsman to come and turn it into drawings that you can use for your future reference. You pay for that and you have that record once and for all. Oh, okay. That, that's right. So another thing is, I I used to, I I am aware that when there is no for for prepare meters for utility, maybe electricity and water, for electricity when you don't have any units remaining, your light will just cut off. Or like uh, water, when you don't have uh, units on it again, the pump will keep working it until you get to a stage that will go burnt. I don't know if there is any sensor that can handle that nowadays. That when there is no water, the pump should just shut off. When there is no unit, when there is no unit, when there is no water. No, no. Okay, so so I see what you mean. Um, when there is no water, exactly. See, that's one of the things you are talking about. There are sensors that you can you can install, right? That when there is no water, the pump goes off. We are talking of like a submersible pump or a, 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 a bow hole. Yeah, we talking about so, surface pump. Surface, surface pump. pump. Surface pump that is dipped into a well or which one? Or that is like a, from a level tank. Like a, a booster pump or a transfer. Yes, on a level tank. Yes, a level pump, tank, yes. Exactly. yes, there are sensors you can use for that. You can, you can get uh, sensors that can be connected to the water and the pump. So that mm-hmm. once the, in fact, those sensors can be connected with that, you know that uh, flow switch that um, that normally uh, uh, starts yeah, and yes. stops the pump, that yes. connected to that, and then once it drops to a level where uh, there's no not enough water for the pump to take, the pump should not come up. Oh, you understand? You know that flow switch itself can be used both ways. Mm-hmm. If water if mm-hmm. water drops in one tank where you are pumping mm-hmm. into. A pump that pumps into it should peak, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, if you use that same flow switch on a tank where you are taking from, mm. if the water drops below a certain level, the pump taking from it should stop. Should stop. <laughs> it's just a reverse that process. It's mm. very simple. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, by me. Yeah, hello, sir. Yeah, uh, in uh, this question is connected with uh, the last uh, question about uh, a site was taken over and uh, they are looking for where a defect is, which mm-hmm. would not have been an issue. I did mean there is a there is as-built an as, as built drawing. Yes. So my question now is this: without as built drawing, it's possible yes. to use a BIM. I'm aware we can use BIM to generate the as built drawing. Is that possible, sir? Yes. So you, what, you, what you're talking about is called 3D imaging. Yes. You're taking the equipment that can be used to scan the building and draw it out. Yes, sir. 
and yes. uh, sir, from you from your and you can also just use tape to measure it and get a draftsman to draw it out. <laughs> uh -huh. So the reason why I'm asking is because of the cost of, the, of using BIM and uh, yes. getting a draftsman to put it out. Yes. So which one yes. is is a uh, so draftsman? Draftsman is, is very cheap. Draftsman is very cheap. You can do you can do floor plans uh, at at the cost close to nothing. Um, that shows you all the spaces in your site and your building. Um, maybe just need uh, if you don't have the survey plan, maybe maybe, maybe you spend a little more to get the uh, building situated on the site. Uh, and then uh, the draftsman can produce elevations to put doors and windows, uh, do sections for you. Um, can produce um, uh, 3D 3D uh, model from those. You know, you can extrude all of those into 3D, where you can see all your doors, windows. Uh, you can, you can position some of your air conditioners and ACs and your uh, panels in their places. Uh, you may not get the level of detail that a full beam that is you know, developed from scratch will give. For example, uh, none of these two technologies, uh, both Draftsman or the uh, uh, 3D imaging scanner can give you what is embedded inside the wall in terms of details of what's happening in there. So there'll be a lot of guesswork on those aspects, but of course, at least you get something you can use to work. For example, you can scope painting, you can scope tiling, you can scope any assets, uh, position and maintenance requirements from those level of drawings. Yes, but the draftsman approach is cheaper. In fact, before we started talking about uh, the 3D imaging and scanning, which is very expensive, by the way, the, 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 the cheapest of those scanners you can get to buy in the market is about 70,000 USD, right? And then to rent it, uh, it's, uh, it's almost... Um, uh, for one project, it's five to ten thousand uh, uh, US dollars. Before you now get the uh, the uh, uh, beam monitoring guys who are going to uh, you know reduce those into drawings and three D uh, models for you. So it's, it's quite uh, evolving. But if you get draftsmen with tapes and measures and some uh, uh, survey equipment, they can actually do a lot. But you take more time um, and take more efforts uh, on their part. But they, of course, they can achieve. Giving you as good drawings. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Hello, Ayami. Go ahead. Yeah, good evening, sir. So sorry for disturbing you and driving you back. My question is not on this topic, it's on assets register. That's why I put the question okay. there. Yes, it's a good um, one. Go when when it comes to issue of asset register, how should it be done? Should it be done in as a location or assets based? For it's instance, best to do it on location by location. You cannot filter. So, so the way uh, asset research should be done is you first of all create your space hierarchy. My site, level one. My building, level two. My zone or floor, level three. Every space in each zone or floor, level four. All of them should have a name. Every space should have a name. Every zone or floor should have a name. Every uh, uh, Building should have a name, you know, all the way to build it up to site. So I create my, my, my site uh, um, uh, space hierarchy. And then I begin to identify all the assets in each of those spaces, right? Uh, once I've placed all the assets in each of those spaces, I cannot do filtering. For example, I can filter out on that same uh, array all ACs, right? And the ACs will all come out. And they will still contain where they are located, where they are installed. Because it's very important when I want to do any maintenance or do any activities to know the specific AC in a specific space, right? Um, so, so, so start by, us, by doing your space hierarchy and develop your asset register space by space. So if I get to the uh, utility area as a space, I now build all the assets in that utility area into the into that particular space, and I'll do that for every room, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, guys. I see a bio miss and still up. Is this from the past question or a new question? Past question, sir. All right. Thank you. All right, guys. Have a nice evening. Uh, see you again in the next class. Bye bye. Thank, Bye, thank you, sir.